All right, looks like a few more people have joined. So let's go ahead. Uh, greetings, everyone, and many thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm Julie Eip, and I'm a Senior Director at the Clean Cooking Alliance, and I'm very pleased to be kicking off the webinar today. This is now the sixth in our Transitioning to Clean Cooking series, which was launched earlier this year by the Clean Cooking Alliance and the World Health Organization as part of the Health and Energy Platform of Action, or HEPA, as it's often called. Uh, and we've covered a number of interesting topics this year that we hope have been useful and helping various stakeholders in accessing the latest data and analysis around clean cooking, in particular as it relates to policy and planning decisions. And today we are poised to continue that trend with an excellent roster of speakers who will be discussing our topic for today, which is on defining and achieving clean cooking. Uh, we'll start with the defining clean discussion with an overview from the WHO on the latest air quality guidelines which were just released earlier this month. Uh, we'll find out what those guidelines mean for the household energy sector. And then we'll also hear from the latest from WHO on how they see uh, defining clean fuels and technologies for cooking and the role of transitional options. Uh, we'll then pivot the discussion to the achievement side with presentations and discussion on the policies that are needed to get us closer to clean cooking for all. This will include an overview from SEI on some analysis that they have done of existing policies and those that seem to be working. And then the SEI team will provide us with an overview of the brand new household energy policy repository, which is a tool that they have been supporting uh, WHO in developing. And we'll get a quick tour of that new tool, which is exciting. Uh, we'll then hear from experts from IRENA, the Global LPG Partnership, and MEX on their views on the policies that are needed to transition to renewable and clean cooking, um, including bio LPG and electric cooking, as well as other uh, renewable fuels as well. Uh, and then we'll have some time for Q&A from the audience and further discussion uh, from our panelists. So we have a full agenda and great speakers as always. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we kick things off. Um, please use the Q&A function for any question, questions for the speakers. Feel free to submit those throughout the session. No need to hold them back. Uh, we'll be compiling them, and then we'll try to get to as many as possible during the Q&A session. Uh, we will record the session, and the slides will be made available to participant, participants on the webpage uh, for the webinar series, which is on the WHO website. Um, which is also where you can find information about upcoming webinars. Um, and with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll now, now hand things over to our first speaker, go to the next slide, um, who is Sophie Goumet of the WHO. She's a technical director uh, in the Department of Environment, Climate Change and Health. And she is going to take us through the new, in, uh, new air quality guidelines and uh, what those mean for the household energy sector. So Sophie, I will pass things over to you, please. Thank you very much, Julie. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> nice to be uh, here with you. Um, so exactly one week ago, uh, WHO was launching the new, uh, the updated WHO air quality guidelines for the to, 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 2021 excuse me so as you all know air pollution is a big uh, is a is a silent killer it's uh, it's killing about 7 million deaths uh, it's, it's killing about 7 million people every every year um, most of the diseases uh, are respiratory cardiovascular but there is an emerging evidence for other diseases as well next slide please and uh, this guideline was a very, very well, sorry, a well-awaited uh, uh, document that has uh, the last update was 15 years ago. So uh, in, in, I'm going to show you in a very briefly what are the new air quality guidelines and what is new in them. Next slide, please. So based on the extensive scientific evidence, the air quality guideline identified the levels of air quality necessary to protect public health worldwide. Uh, the current document provides recommendations on the uh, air quality guideline levels and as well as interim target for six uh, classical pollutants, namely particulate matter, PM2.5, PM10, ozone, um, NO2, SO2, and carbon monoxide. 
But also what is new is that in this new guideline is that we have a qualitative good practice statements for certain type of particulate matter. The, the guideline level are, um, are not uh, legally binding document, uh, not, they are not legally binding. This, uh, rather, they should be used as an evidence informed reference to help uh, decision makers in setting legally binding standards and goals for air quality management. They are uh, an instrument to design effective measures to achieve reduction of air pollution and therefore to protect human health. Next slide, please. Since the last update, which happened 15 years ago, there has been a lot of new evidence in uh, both in quality, but also in quantity, especially coming from places that are very much polluted because uh, historically, um, a lot of the scientific evidence on air quality was coming from, uh, from Europe and uh, North America, where the air where levels of air pollution were, depends in where, what is the reference, but they were relatively low compared to what other regions may, may experience. And, uh, and, and so now since 15 years, there has been a, a really a huge amount of new, of new evidence. Uh, there are also now clearer insights about source of emissions and the contribution of air pollutant to the global burden of diseases. And uh, for that reason, and after a systematic review of the accumulated evidence, several of the updated air quality guideline levels are now lower than 15 years ago. And uh, there are also new values for example, uh, there is a new value for peak season ozone and a 24-hour 20, um, value for NO2 and for carbon monoxide as well as new interim targets. Next slide, please. So in this slide, you can you see the, ta the, the table with the new values uh, for, each, uh, for each pollutant. There is also the average, averaging time. Uh, IT means interim targets and uh, AQG level is the, it's the, it's the guideline value. In, in italic, you can see the value that was uh, before the guideline value. So um, uh, not all of them have one, but most. Uh, air quality guideline levels for both long and short-term exposure in relation to critical health outcomes. There are uh, those interim targets. So those interim targets, the, the purpose of the interim target uh, is that it, it, was, it was acknowledged uh, that the, the, it might be very difficult for some countries to actually achieve the guideline value. Therefore, the, um, 15 years ago already, we had interim targets. The group, the expert group had decided that to, to, to help country, to, to accompany country to, 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 this, uh, to, the, to the overall, to the ideal of the guideline, that they should be providing some interim targets so that it can be a first step towards the, the, the end, the, the long-term long goal. And finally, uh, as I was saying before, we have a good practice statement, so qualitative statement, if you wish, in the management of certain type of particulate matter for which evidence is insufficient to derive quantitative air quality guideline level, but points to their health relevance. So there will be, I mean, those good practice statements, I have a slide later, I can, I can explain a little bit more later. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So this slide is uh, is basically um, uh, showing for four different uh, pollutants for the long to for the annual mean for the long term value. As you can see here, so fine particulate matter, uh, fine fine particulate matter. Yes. So. PM 2.5. PM 2.5 is the pollutant that WHO is speaking a lot about. It's because it's a it's a good proxy in it's a good proxy uh, pollutant for air pollution. The previous guideline value was 10. Now it has been half to five. Um, the PM 2 PM 10 uh, it's uh, it, it has been reduced from 20 to 15. And for ozone, we have this new peak value uh, for for peak season. This value for peak season of 60 microgram per cubic meter. And finally, nitrogen dioxide has been reduced by 75%. Uh, so it used to be 40 microgram per cubic meter, and now it's 10. Um, next, next slide, please. Okay, here the WHO air quality guideline provide various good practice statements. So it, as was mentioning before. So the first one is sun and dust storm. So in many places of the world, um, uh, there is a large part of particulate matter that actually comes from, uh, from desert dust, from, uh, from sand or from natural erosion. And um, although this, has, this is a challenge for many countries because they might say, okay, look, this is not coming from, a, this is not anthropogenic source, then nothing we can do about it. There is no health effect. 
the idea of the of this good practice statement was to to provide some statements or summary of the evidence on the health effect of sand and dust storms because uh, the desert dust has an impact on health unfortunately and there is some elements of a good practice statement how to manage how to manage uh, desert dust and sand and dust storms basically there is also for black elemental carbon and for ultrafine particles those are um, topics uh, which are very relevant and very for which there is a lot of interest and fortunately the the expert group decided that there was not sufficient evidence to provide a, a quantitative guidelines therefore there are some recommendation about how to measure it and uh, what's uh, what are the gaps and what needs to be done uh, so that countries can get some support for that next slide please so what can countries do with their quality guidelines so the guideline is a tool. The guideline really needs to be used as a tool to guide, to drive and support the selection and adoption of measures to reduce, to reduce exposure to air pollution. They can, they can, it can be used as a, as a support to establish or update their legally binding air quality standards and develop policy to achieve it. Uh, it can also help to strengthen multi-sectoral cooperation at national, regional and international level and advocating for air quality. This is especially uh, important for um, I mean, for example, for PM, PM travels, PM is not, uh, can travel long distances. So um, even if you do as much as you can in your own uh, local area, there is little you can, will be able to, to reduce. And finally, uh, the, the, the guideline also uh, <clears throat> will help to, to, re to reduce health inequities related to air pollution. Finally, actions to reduce uh, air pollution require cooperation of various sectors and stakeholders because every, every setting is different, the source of pollution is different. Um, so it's very much important that uh, there is not only monitoring of air quality, but knowing where the source are so that you can coordinate with different sectors to reduce the most, uh, the, the, the source that is the most important. And finally, the health sector is crucial in raising awareness. So the health sector, the health sector really needs to be involved for many reasons. First, because they need to be aware of the health impact of air pollution. They can really serve as advocates to raise awareness, to gather evidence, because without having good data, good and reliable data, it's difficult to move forward. And advising people on how to mitigate impact and join an advocacy effort. So of course, this is a, this is a WHO's big battle to, to try to really engage the health sector more. So we are uh, in, in that respect, we are developing training material, uh, uh, specifically targeting the health sector, uh, clinicians, so everyone who is uh, in, um, dealing with patients, because as much as air pollution uh, epidemiology might be known and everybody knows their impact, concretely, uh, there is still little uh, tools and, and, uh, and support for, for the health sector to deal with that. Next point, please. And finally, uh, air pollution is, um, it's, it, it was very timely to have this new guideline now because um, there is the, the COP26 coming and the air pollution is really, is really used to, to, as an entry point to tackle climate change. There are a lot of uh, co-benefits of the reducing sources of air pollution, which are the same as the, for climate change, especially the short life pollutant, short, short life pollutant. And, uh, and, um, and this is why uh, committing to the guideline is something that WHO is really pushing and really trying to, to, to have the health sector around it to, to really to do this joint advocacy. And with this, I thank you very much. And I will leave it to Heather to provide with you with a very good overview on what is the implication for the household. However, thank you so much, Sophie. Um, Super interesting to see the new guidelines. Um, and as Sophie said, we'll now pass it over to Heather Adair Rohani, um, who's also a technical officer at WHO, who will talk us through um, some of the implications here for the clean uh, household energy sector. Heather, over to you. Thank you. Hi, I, as introduced, my name is Heather Adair Rohani, and I lead the work at um, WHO on health and energy. So my presentation, I'm really just gonna to try to build this connection. So Sophie gave a great presentation on air quality guidelines. And these guidelines apply to all environments. So although people think of those specific levels as outdoor, but they actually provide um, apply to the indoor setting as well. And WHO has worked a lot to combine this, uh, these particular um, guidelines together so that we can actually take 
what we know is important for the air around us and translate that into technical recommendations that can be used in the home to influence policies, technolo technological innovations and things within the home themselves to make sure that it's clean air inside. I'll, my presentation will give you a quick disease overview of the disease burden and what exactly is clean. That's the purpose of this presentation to help that we at WHO, although we're fuel and agnostic, technology agnostic, we just want to get to clean, but we're going to tell you how we current ca currently categorize it. And we'll also touch on what we're doing in terms of trying to report on transitional options and how these link to ISO targets. Next slide, please. So um, the energy access, this, this is a bit of a sad story at the beginning, but then we, we at the end of the presentation, we see the positive things that come out. So currently the energy access, access situation is quite dire. Um, we've been re remaining around two and a half, three billion people um, lacking access to clean fuels and technology in the home for the last three or four decades, if not more. So currently in 2019, the most recent estimate, about one third of the world's population lacks access to, access to clean fuels and technology for cooking. Next slide, please. So this, why is WHO care? <laughs> this is because as it is, it's a major source of air pollution. And this, as we just heard from Sophie, we even know now that air pollution levels need to be even lower to protect health and to prevent premature disease and premature um, morbidity. Um, so household air pollution itself is responsible for about 3.8 million deaths. And those include deaths from stroke, ischemic heart disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, lung cancer, and, and pneumonia. And as Sophie had pointed out, there are actually a number of other health outcomes where evidence uh, base has grown greatly, um, for which we are currently um, looking at and seeing if we can derive risk and provide quantitative evidence of the disease burden that, uh, that is associated with these other health outcomes, such as adverse pregnancy outcomes, tuberculosis, um, uh, asthma, these things. In addition to these deaths, um, these premature deaths, there's also death and injuries associated with burns and poisoning from the lack of uh, clean fuels and technology in the home. So why WHO is doing this? It's because it's a huge health um, burden, but also a huge opportunity to really protect the health of the people in the poorest populations by implementing clean household energy. Next slide, please. So as I said, there is this opportunity. And where we see as WHO, we really saw this connection, this opportunity to, to roll out clean household energy to, to protect health. Now, how do people know what clean is? We know for many, many years, there have been people putting so-called improved cook, cook, cook stoves out. And in many cases, these cook stoves often put out more pollution than the actual open fire or traditional stove that was being used. So they were more improved in terms of their fuel efficiency, but not necessarily in terms of the emissions and the health damaging pollutants that are being emitted. So WHO um, in 2014, reckon, well, recognizing this, and after numbers of years of synthesizing evidence, in 2014, WHO put guidelines out for indoor quality household fuel combustion, which provide the technical recommendations, um, a performance recommendations for the fuel and technology in combination to what, how one could what those values would be to ensure that they could achieve air quality guidelines in the home. So those values that Sophie presented earlier, that's what the, we did in the indoor air quality guidelines as we translated what would you would need the fuel and technology to do together in combination to achieve those values that Sophie had presented earlier. So accordingly, the next step was this opportunity of the sustainable development goals, where SDGs were specifically where we were able to define and mark, a, have a clear definition, technical recommendation definition of what clean is for clean cooking. And in this case, it was clean for health as linked by the WHO guidelines for indoor air quality guidelines. Um, next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, WHO itself, we don't say this fuel or in this technology should be used. Rather, we want the performance of the fuels and technologies to meet certain emission rate targets or meet specific recommendations included in these guidelines. So we're in theory fuel and technology agnostic to say. However, currently we need to help countries understand what does that mean on the ground? What does that mean for them while they're developing policies and programs to be rolled out? What could you invest in and sell to your population? What market can you build? So we have therefore taken some of the most scalable solutions and categorized them so that we can monitor progress using household energy surveys to report nationally, regularly, annually for countries to see their progress towards achieving SDG 7 for clean cooking. 
Um, so as I said, the clean itself, when we say clean, these are specifically fuels and technology combinations that we know achieve, achieve air pollution levels that are recommended by the WHO guidelines. Now we have two specific recommendations. We have one that provides interim target where you achieve not the actual air quality guidelines, but one of those steps towards it. And then we have recommendations that actually allow you to achieve those guidelines. We recognize that achieving the guidelines themselves is very challenging. Hence, so, as Sophie pointed, we have interim targets for air pollutant levels, but we also have interim targets for um, specific fuels and technology in the home. Now, transitional, um, the transitional aspect is specifically relates because we recognize that changing from polluting fuels and technology to clean isn't just as easy as flipping a switch. It's going to require a lot of um, infrastructure to build, a lot of market establishment, and to really be able to reach, reach those remote populations, it may take a little bit longer so that we can get this infrastructure in this market scalable and in place. And accordingly, though, we don't want countries to not be able to show the progress. We want them to see and be able to look at how they're progressing. What are the health benefits they are achieving in their energy transition to ultimately clean? And we'll begin to see, we're going to begin reporting on transitional. Transitional is specifically defined as those fuels and technologies that provide some health benefits, um, statistically significant health benefits. They don't actually achieve the specific recommendation target levels included in the WHO guidelines. And finally, we have those polluting fuels and technologies which provide no health and benefits, no health benefits in combination. Next slide, please. So as I was mentioning earlier, we have these specific um, targets, in our emission rate targets, where we look at what the performance of the fuel and the technology in, in laboratory or in field settings and see what those emissions are and what their specific rates are. And as you can see here, if you could click one more time, please, thank you. These former guidelines, these guidelines were, um, these indoor quality guidelines were published in 2014. So they referenced the previous guidelines that were published in 2005 that Sophie was referencing. Now, how does this translate to the household energy tech uh, guidelines now? And how is this gonna impact clean cooking? It's as simple as this. As we were very involved in making sure that household air pollution was fully recognized in the, um, these air quality guidelines that were just launched a week ago, we made sure that the interim targets continue to line up. So the former air quality guideline value of 10 micrograms per meter cubed is now interim target four. So therefore, these as specific emission rate targets included in the household fuel combustion guidelines are still applicable and we're still able to quantify the health benefits. So click one more time, please. So you can see basically what was formerly the um, air quality guideline value in 2006 has now become interim target. And these emission rate targets will still apply in, in, in terms of monitoring clean cooking. And as we as WHO will continue to evaluate the evidence and see if we need to provide additional emission rate targets to specifically meet the new guideline value. But for the moment, this is how we'll be monitoring clean cooking for the, for the near future, um, probably at least by, until 2030. Next slide, please. So as I said, it's a matter of the fuel and technology. So what really are some of the clean fuels and technology that are scalable and on the market and that we're currently counting using household surveys at the moment for national, um, annual and global regional reporting for the sustainable development goals? Those include, we have electricity, of course, and, and these, oh, I should say before we give, these are all at point of use. We, we are not able to go back and look at the specific full energy life cycle analysis. So we have, these assume at point of use in terms of clean for health. We have electricity, we have biogas, we have alcohol fuels, solar, natural pipe gas, um, and as well as LPG and other gaseous fuels uh, and natural gas. Um, and turn, that's what we consider clean. And then what we count as polluting at the moment are those fuels and technology that rely on um, biomass fuels, such as charcoal, wood, crop waste, dung, and then we have um, even garbage. People report, um, um, report using garbage as a fuel, as well as kerosene and raw coal, for example, or other forms of polluting, what we consider polluting. And we consider them polluting because with these fuels, even if you find we, there's no scalable stove that will actually um, uh, actually function in a clean way and allow to um, minimize the amount of emissions that are going to, to minimize health impact. 
Though we do in these guidelines have specific recommendations about against discouraging the use of kerosene due to additional health impacts not just associated with air pollution, such as ingestion, poisoning, and et cetera, and as well as for unprocessed coal or raw coal because of other specific contaminants that are exist in that in that particular fuels like arsenic and mercury and what have you. And then finally, you see at the bottom, there are some, we are saying with innovation, there are some biomass fuels that are becoming closer to, or some that have actually proven in laboratory settings to achieve at least the interim target for WHO guidelines. And these include typically pelleted fuel biomass stoves. Not all, but some. So we don't necessarily have a specific categorization at this moment. And but as surveys are currently um, expanding their number of questions asked on the fuels and stoves used, we'll soon to hope to quant be able to quantify that and report that on a regular basis. Next slide, please. So again, as I mentioned earlier, this translational fuels are those ones that provide some health benefits, statistically significant health benefit using um, epidemiological studies, but don't necessarily achieve the, um, the guideline values and are really there to help countries monitor the progress and monitor what potential intermediate um, technologies are available and scalable to protect the health of the population. Next slide. So WHO, as these guidelines came out, we've worked very closely with the International Standards Organization and along with Clean Cooking Alliance and others to make sure that these particular guidelines have been integrated or aligned in some ways with the International Standards Organization's um, voluntary performance targets. And um, so as you can see from tier one to tier five are better performance and therefore better health benefits. Um, next slide, please. And using, as I know I'm close on, um, over time, WHO classifications by ISO BPT targets are here, where we, for example, for carbon monoxide, the only BPT5 target is the only one that we can consider clean for health. But for the um, fine particulate matter of PM2.5, the ISO BPT targets of four and five can, can be considered clean. And then transitional for carbon monoxide are four and three BPT targets, tiers, I'm sorry. And then um, for uh, PM, the transitional is uh, BPT tier um, three, and the other six will be. Thank you, and again, my apologies for going over time, and I hope this is helpful. Thank you so much, Heather, and no worries on time. That was a lot to cover. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I, I think we'll probably have a lot of questions here. Um, I really appreciated your comment, Heather, that this is not something that will just happen with the flip of the switch. As we all know, this will take time um, as people make the transition and great to see that WHO is sort of acknowledging the transitional options and starting to um, sort of count those towards progress. So I think um, that's great news. Uh, and yeah, as we say, it, it will not just happen with the flip of a, a switch. There's still significant uh, need in terms of financing, infrastructure, um, and the policies that will enable that. So that is a great segue to the second part of our webinar today, which we'll be talking about what are those policies that are currently in place, um, you know, to what extent are they working, and then uh, what, what additional policies are needed if we're actually going to make this uh, transition in, in the near future. So um, I'm pleased to welcome uh, colleagues from SEI. Uh, we have Anisha Nazareth, who's an associate scientist, as well as Fiona Lamb, who is a research fellow at SEI. And they are going to take us through uh, a new tool that they have developed with uh, WHO, which is this Household Energy Policy Repository. Um, which they will tell you all about uh, uh, when I hand things over to them. So um, I, I think Anisha will speak first. So I will go ahead and hand things over to her to tell us about the uh, repository and some of the insights that they've uh, uh, gleaned from that. Thanks so much, Julie. Uh, it will be me going first, so we're flipping okay. it around, but that's fine. Uh, hi, everyone. Really nice to, to be here. Uh, so yeah, on behalf of the team uh, listed here, I'll be presenting a new global repository of household energy policies that aims to support a tra transition to cleaner fuels for cooking, heating and lighting that SEI has developed in partnership with WHO. Um, I will describe the repository, including how we built it and some lessons we've drawn from the content. And then my colleague Anisha will give you a quick tour of the repository, what it looks like. Um, so we're all very aware of the negative impact that a lack of access to clean fuels has on people and the environment. For decades, development organizations, researchers and governments have implemented projects and developed policies 
reduce these impacts with mixed success. WHO focuses its work on global health and has been working with global partners to reduce the burden of disease from polluting fuels for almost two decades now. Um, and understanding that a problem of this scale can't be solved without attention to policy, WHO partnered with SEI to assemble a repository of policies with the goal of understanding what actions have resulted in increased access to clean household fuels and technologies. The next slide, please. The, the repository is an online clearinghouse for policies, regulations and legislation affecting household energy use at the national, regional and local levels. The repository is intended to act as a knowledge base that can support transitions to cleaner household fuels, and it will be part of WHO's Clean Household Energy Solutions Toolkit, or CHEST. Um, and these are online resources that can support practitioners and policymakers in developing and evaluating policies that can promote clean household energy use. The repository will be part of Module 2 of CHEST on identification of technological and policy interventions. Next slide, please. So how did we go about building the repository? Uh, compiling the, the repository involved three separate processes. So first, the team conducted an expansive web search to identify candidate documents. We then used content analysis software to filter documents based on specific inclusion criteria. Um, through text-based visualizations like the one you see here, we inspected the documents to determine their relevance. And finally, we conducted a series of expert consultations to ensure that the web searches didn't overlook any key policies or evaluations that were particularly impactful or, or relevant. In addition to understand the extent to which policies have achieved their stated objectives, the repository includes impact assessments or evaluations carried out by independent researchers, and we use an academic search to, to identify those. Next slide, please. Uh, so what's in the repository then? Well, it includes 124 clean household energy policies from 34 countries and the EU, so representing all WHO regions. There are also links to 31 independent evaluations that assess the impact of 23 policies. Uh, and of course, we'd really like to expand on this. So later on in the presentation, Anisha will explain how um, to add policies to the repository. Um, the repository includes policies targeting cooking, heating and lighting, using clean fuels and technologies that include electricity, LPG, biogas, solar, thermal and photovoltaic, ethanol, or cleaner biomass options like uh, biomass pellets. And they're categorized in a number of ways. So the repository includes policies that mention polluting fuels like firewood, charcoal, mineral coal, or kerosene. In these cases, the policies are designed either to reduce consumption or to encourage more sustainable use alongside other cleaner fuels. Policies uh, rely on a range of instruments, including financial measures like taxes, subsidies, or voucher programs, regulatory instruments like limits or bans on specific fuels, technologies, or activities. Um, trade policies, direct investments in activities like research uh, and development, grid expansion or other infrastructure. It includes developing codes or standards for energy efficiency or emissions, and of course, uh, information campaigns to raise awareness and induce behavioural change. Uh, next slide, please. So the burning question then, are the policies in the repository um, achieving their stated objectives? And this seemingly very simple question is really not that easy to answer, as you might have guessed. Um, many of the policies in the repository were in introduced relatively recently. Um, over half of them have been in place for uh, less than five years. So it might be too early to measure observable outcomes. Um, also, most policies don't specify quantitative objectives um, and lack well-defined monitoring and evaluation plans. So it's quite difficult to know whether they've had meaningful impact. Uh, I would like to mention a couple of notable policies, though, and share some lessons we drew from them, uh, one from Indonesia and one from, from India. Both supported increased access to LPG, but for quite different reasons. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so Indonesia had subsidized kerosene for many years, and the cost put tremendous strain on national accounts. Um, so in an effort to reduce this cost, Indonesia shifted subsidies from kerosene to LPG. And they chose LPG because the cost per unit of useful energy was lower and distribution infrastructure relatively simple to put in place. Um, and obviously LPG is much cleaner than kerosene. The program provided free LPG starter packages and subsidized refills while gradually withdrawing subsidies for kerosene. And it worked. 
Um, Indonesia saw a 93% reduction in kerosene consumption between 2008 and 2016, and an increase in the percentage of households using LPG as a primary cooking fuel from less than 10% in the early 2000s uh, to over 80% today. One evaluation estimated the government saved over $15 billion by 2016. However, the cost of LPG subsidies continues to increase, um, and the government is feeling real pressure now to implement additional reforms that can reduce costs, for example, shifting from a universal subsidy on small cylinders bought by rich and poor alike to one that targets uh, poor consumers. Of course, um, targeting really is the linchpin of any subsidy program, and poor targeting often leads to policy failures. So next slide, please. Um, India's uh, LPG subsidy is an example of what can be done to improve targeting. So in India, access to LPG increased through the early 2000s, but it didn't reach the poor. Um, so in 2016, to boost access, the Indian government introduced the Prada Mantri Ujwala Yoyana, or PMUY scheme. Um, and this scheme subsidized both LPG connections and cylinder refills, specifically for women in households classified as below the poverty line. The connection subsidy covered about half the cost of an, a new LPG hookup, including the first cylinder um, and associated fees and equipment. By mid-2019, the scheme had provided LPG access to 80 million households. Uh, targeting and financing were really key to its success. Enrollment is limited to poor households who are identified use, using nationally issued biometric ID cards, and subsidies on refills are paid back to bank accounts linked to the ID. Overall, the program achieved its main goal, providing access to 80 million poor families. But there's evidence um, that most continue to use polluting fuels for some or all of their cooking. A recent study, in fact, found that after one year, only 28% of families used enough LPG for half of their cooking needs. 24% um, didn't purchase a single refill. So millions of people have access, but many don't use LPG. Um, regularly and choose polluting fuels instead for some of their needs, which means that the program isn't really generating the health and environmental benefits that the Indian government had envisioned. Next slide, please. What about other, other regions? Um, so in, in addition to India and Indonesia, which both achieved their main objectives, Kenya has seen a huge shift from charcoal and kerosene to LPG in the past 10 years. In South Africa, the percentage of households using main, um, cooking mainly with electricity has steadily climbed in the past 20 years. And in China, there's been a dramatic decline in res residential use uh, of coal. However, there are still many challenges. Many of the evaluations we collected noted that the higher cost of cleaner energy options, even when subsidized, were a barrier to access and regular use. Um, this is true not only for poor families in India, but also in Ghana and in Cameroon, where smaller scale policies also promote LPG for cooking. Uh, and this is true for other energy carriers and end uses. For example, China's coal ban, which is largely considered a success, uh, failed to reach some of the poorest households. So I'm sure you're very curious now to know uh, what the repository looks like. So I'll hand over to Anisha, who will give you a quick tour. Hi, um, so I hope you can see my screen and on the screen you should be seeing an over, uh, the landing page of the Household Energy Policy Reports Free, the URL for which is householdenergypolicies.org. And the landing page basically has a table that shows an overview of all the policies that are currently present in our database, along with options to search through each of the uh, columns, add more columns. Um, view the table in full screen, download the data as CSV, etc. There's also a, a quick search that will enable you to search through all of the policies across all dimensions. If you want more specific information about a policy, uh, you need to click on the policy, which will take you to a page that gives you an overview of the policy as well as all the data about the policy that we have. And you also have a link where you can download the PDF copy of the policy if that is available. The countries tab gives an overview of uh, the different the, the, an overview of the distribution of policies by country in our database. And you can also, you also have the option from that tab to filter by country and get an overview of the policies for that country. On the evaluations tab, we have a list of evaluations present in the database along with links to which policies they are related to. 
And then we have a resources tab, which contains an, a list of fact sheets, reports, as well as related WHO pages and databases that are similar from which we drew some of our policies. There's also a box to submit new information. And so you can click on that to open up a form to submit new policies or new evaluations. Um, the about tab contains information about the policies, uh, the experts we consulted and the methods we used. And once again, there is a, a tab to submit new policies or evaluation information, which you think might be relevant for our database. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. And Great, thank you so much, um, Anisha and Fiona for walking us through the new repository. Uh, we've included a link to it in the chat function so that folks can uh, click through and do some exploration. Um, I, I personally think it's a really exciting tool. It's something that we at CCA get asked a lot, um, you know, sort of where is an overview of, of the different policies in a given country. Um, and I think it'll be a really great resource for companies, investors, researchers, the whole, um, really range of stakeholders that, that work on this issue. So congrats again uh, to the SEI and WHO teams uh, for putting that together and launching it. And many thanks again to Sophie and Heather for um, their uh, overviews as well. Again, I think there'll be a lot of questions on the, on the new air quality guidelines. So um, uh, feel free to submit those through the Q&A function. Um, I will now pass things over to uh, Rob Bayless, who's a senior scientist at SEI, um, who will moderate the next uh, section of our webinar, uh, which will include uh, some presentations uh, and discussion with uh, various experts within the clean cooking energy access space. So I will pass things over to Rob to um, introduce this section. Rob, over to you. Julie, thanks so much. Uh, and thanks for the invitation to moderate this panel. Uh, so about 45 minutes remaining in our uh, webinar today, and uh, the next few minutes will be taken by three speakers. Uh, we'll be talking about their uh, approaches to making cleaner fuels available. Um, our first speaker is uh, Uta Collier from the International Renewable Energy Agency. And uh, after that, we have uh, presentations from Kimball Chen and Simon Batchelor, and I'll introduce each uh, as they come up. So first, let me pass off to Uta. Each speaker will have about 10, uh, five minutes rather, and then we'll shift over into a panel discussion. Uta, take it away. Great, thank you, Rob. And also for me, congratulations to the team from SCI and WHO. I'm quite excited by this new repository thank because you. I know how difficult it is to find information on policies. Um, so obviously I'm from the International Renewable Energy Agency, so you won't be surprised that I'm going to talk about renewables. Now, I joined the agency just about four months ago after having focused on energy access for two and a half years previously. You know, I've done lots of work on the, the broader energy transition stuff. And it has struck me, can we go to the first, the next slide, please? It has struck me that, you know, um, Folks who, who are thinking about net zero and 2050, where we need to be, just tend to almost forget that we do still have, uh, you know, certainly people talk about electricity access more often than clean cooking, as you know, but certainly, you know, if you add them all together, we're, we're close to 3 billion at least people without sufficient access. And it's astonishing how those two often just don't, it doesn't get taken into account. And there's certainly an assumption, I, I checked that with my colleagues, you know, when we do our modeling uh, for 2050, it's always kind of assumed, oh yes, you know, we'll, we'll sort out the NA energy access stuff by 2030 as for the SDGs, and then we don't have to want, need to worry about it, which as we all know, it's of course not so simple. But I just, I just wanted to put this into context in that, Okay, you know, climate change 
is what where we need what we need to <laughs> worry about, of course. Um, and if you're looking at where we are at the moment, the, the contribution from the cooking problem is is quite large. And of course, we've got a problem that we don't count it properly. We all know that. So I, I've just put, put this on here in terms of the actual energy consumption. It's astonishing. People forget that 8% globally is the traditional use of biomass. So it is a significant issue. And when we're looking at 2050, I mean, I would say, of course, we're all very concerned about the health cons um, considerations, but from a climate perspective, we don't actually have space. Even if we weren't worried about health, we don't have space to continue this use of very inefficient use of biomass. And of course, there's all the environmental implications because it's incredibly challenging to achieve net zero. We are going to need to use a lot of biomass, but that's all gonna to have to be extremely efficient, uh, you know, carbon capture and storage, of course, to some extent, uh, uh, sorry, bioenergy with carbon cap, with capture and storage. So yeah, there are so many reasons why we need to get out of this mess. And of course, um, you know, we're very much focused on this needs to be a, a just and energy transition. So can we go to the next slide, please? There is, of course, this challenging bioenergy issue. And Heather has already talked about the issue of improved cook cookstoves. I've called them a mixed blessing here. Um, but the reality is we mustn't forget that the we're in this current state where sub-Saharan Africa in particular still cooks with most of it still cooks with solid biomass, you all know the, the figures. Um, somehow we're not gonna get that switch immediately. So somehow we need to, I mean, I, I do hope we're going to make much progress, but there, there have been issues with the pellet stoves, even if they meet air pollution guidelines, there hasn't been that scale up. It's been extremely difficult. So we do need that switch. Um, I mean, there's another graph from our work from, um, you know, at the moment, half of the bioenergy being in the household sector, it needs to actually go into other sectors. So any bioenergy we're gonna be using is limited, but of course we do need the more modern types, the biogas, and I, I'm glad to see we're going to hear about bio. LPG later on. But I, I just thought a little reminder here um, where we are on biogas, per capita production of biogas at the moment. Well, it's, it's you know, most advanced in, in a few countries, China, um, India, Vietnam. We have had biogas programs in Africa, but it's still, and there has been an increase, but it's from a very, very small start. So we've got such a long way to go. And that then brings me to the policies which we're talking about here. So next slide, please. I sort of started <laughs> putting all the barriers on, on I first had a really long list and then I thought, oh, well, okay, I, I try and group them a little bit. But I think we all know that there are a huge number of barriers in the clean cooking space, but some are, some are generic, but some are also very specific to renewables. So lack of policy attention, for example, is generic. But then if, if we're looking at some of the renewables, we have particularly high costs of equipment. I mean, those lovely pellet stoves are not cheap you know, $100 for five for basic stove, uh, biogas as well, lack of access to finance. Well, that's sort of a generic problem we see in many countries for electricity access as well. There's sort of some very nice niche solutions. I know people talk about solar cookers sometimes, but you know, that doesn't necessarily solve, solve the problem because it's not what people need more broadly. The sustainability issues, um, yeah, it's not so straightforward, even, even if you, you know, the, the pelleting, well, you know, if you have plantations, complicated, uh, and you all know about cultural and gender issues. So next slide, please. We did um, 
a report last year on um, heating and cooling, actually, which uh, I could have put on the slide, where jointly with the IEA and REN21. And it's actually interesting because I've worked a lot in on the end use sectors. I mean, some of those barriers are not necessarily specific to clean cooking. We, we have a problem more broadly in terms of getting renewables into end use sectors, certainly in terms of cost of equipment, in terms of awareness, etc. So the message on the clean cooking, renewables for clean cooking side, in, in some ways are even quite similar to the mass message we, we put out more broadly on, on end use sectors and heating and cooling as well. It's, there's a the lack of policy attention, um, the tackling cost and finance barrier, um, obviously there's, there's the supply chain thing and create awareness about impacts and solutions. So, so those top headings I could equally apply elsewhere. But then, of course, we have the specific issues um, about that, that we need to get cooking into the broader energy planning, the energy strategies, and that, that combined grid, off-grid and clean cooking is so, so essential, but we're still not seeing it in many places. And I'm sure in the, the policy repository, we have some of the great examples like the Kenyan strategy, and, and there's there in many ways ahead of many other countries. But if you, if you look at the rise indicators, uh, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, I looked at that again the other day, there are actually very few countries. I mean, there, there are three, just three African countries which, are, which can be classified as having an advanced clean cooking framework, which would be this kind of, I've shown here. And then so many of the countries which almost have zero access to clean cooking have next to no measures. So we've got, it's extremely challenging. And of course, in the short term, I think the priority has to be sort, sorting out clean cooking more broadly and, and accept there are some transition fuels probably needed. Um, but then in the, in the longer term, we need, we need to do this within the broader energy transition. So, the more we can shift now to the, the, clean, the cleaner options or, or even electric cooking, which Simon will talk about, the better. So that's my last one. So I'll pass on the next speaker. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Ute. Uh, so now we'll pass off to Kimball Chen, who's the chairman of the Global LPG Partnership. And uh, just want to remind our, our panelists to, to keep their, their speaking presentation to, to five, and then we'll have uh, more time for a panel discussion at, at the end. Take it, uh, Kimball, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Rob. So I have three slides apart from this title slide. So shall we move to the next slide? Um, bio LPG. Bio LPG is LPG, propane and or butane. LPG is the chemical produced Bio LPG is produced from green feedstocks, particularly agricultural residues, municipal solid waste, vegetable oils, and waste animal fat. It is an effective circular economy fuel solution because it uses what is inevitably produced from human activity and agriculture, and it uses it to create green fuel. It is chemically identical to fossil LPG. LPG, the chemical, is identical whether it's produced from uh, green uh, feedstocks or it's a fossil origin produced out of the ground or from refineries. Bio LPG, therefore, because it's identical to fossil LPG, fits into existing LPG supply chains and complies with and fits easily and uh, obviously into proven policy, regulatory safety and technical best practices and marketing practices and financial sector knowledge of and willingness to finance. Using first generation technology, bio LPG is already being produced commercially in the EU and the US. This is not uh, some uh, new innovation which needs to be tested and, and determined if it's robust. It exists. Many research institutes and governments are interested in the potential of bio-LPG to enable a green future at scale. What are the advantages of bio-LPG? First of all, because it's identical chemically to the fossil LPG presently in uh, great use all around the world, it can be blended into and replace, if desired and available, the fossil LPG used by billions of people worldwide. So it offers a transition in terms of uh, blending and eventually a substitution 
in terms of uh, large scale production uh, later. Bio LPG also has a great economic advantage. It can be used in existing LPG distribution infrastructure and the household stoves and other equipment that households already have invested in. Hundreds of millions of people, billions of people have the use of or are served by LPG distribution infrastructure and they have stoves. So you don't have to reinvest in, in creating a distribution network. You just insert the bio LPG into the supply chain and it delivers all the multiple SDG benefits of switching to cooking with LPG away from switching, uh, away from cooking with biomass. For developing countries, it allows them to prioritize LPG sector development and to ask for support from the international community and development institutions because it is part of a green path to clean cooking and net zero emissions. And finally, it's very important to understand that based upon present technical and techno-economic analysis, bio-LPG is projected to cost the same or less than fossil LPG from international markets, and thus will contribute to increased affordability of LPG also because it is produced domestically in developing countries from their locally, their domestic wastes, and it, re it reduces or eliminates the need to use hard currency to import international LPG, which is subject also to the volatility of international market movements in fossil LPG prices. How will LPG be implemented? So uh, in many places, public and private sector parties are moving forward on second generation bio LPG development. Second generation bio LPG plants are projected to be in operation as early as 2026, which obviously gives a runway towards 2030 to have perhaps substantial stuff in operation or announced and financed and starting to be built by 2030. So clean cooking and uh, uh, bio LPG at scale by 2030. My organization has been focused on the potential of bio LPG to overcome objections to fossil LPG and to provide the economic benefits of use in existing widespread infrastructure and uh, policy and market mechanisms. And we've been uh, looking at this for several years and we now ha have received the mandate from uh, the leading uh, second generation bio LPG technology to license this technology to qualified public and private sector LPG supply projects in the developing world. I want to note that Sub-Saharan Africa has ample municipal waste and agricultural residues to produce millions of tons of bio LPG, enough for the cooking needs of hundreds of millions of people. And if LPG is paired with uh, electricity in the clean cooking stack that uh, some of the others, such as uh, my, my, the next speaker, uh, Simon Batcher has studied and, and uh, talked about and presented research on, um, it could be that bio LPG plus electricity could provide the, the clean solution that will work for many years and, uh, and, and deliver substantial, if not uh, the complete solution to the cooking sector net zero emissions targets of 2050. And the other thing I want to point out is that bio LPG and LPG are well known to the financial sector. One of the keys, which was referred to by Ute in her presentation just before me, is that uh, we need to find uh, finance, financing access but financing access has to also be accompanied by financing availability. If there's no one there with money who wants to offer it to people, uh, there's no such thing as access. So financial institutions know about the LPG sector. If you can offer a clean LPG solution, this is something where uh, the availability and willingness and knowledge and management capability of the supply side of finance is readily available at scale to support um, LPG meaning bio LPG. I think um, I'll wait for any questions on the panel. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thanks so much. Uh, very interesting. I'm sure there'll be uh, some questions during the panel discussion. Uh, okay, now I'm happy to hand it over to Simon Batchelor, uh, who is the UK Research and Innovation Coordinator for the Modern, Modern Energy Cooking Services Project based in the UK. Uh, Simon has no slides. He's just gonna talk to us, which is great. Uh, so Simon, please take it away. Thank you. Uh, I thought that, uh, can I just check you can hear me? Yep, all good. Yeah, okay, sorry, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I, I thought it would be a really interesting presentation from all the others, and it's always good to not have slides so that you can actually address uh, what everybody else said. 
Um, so where to start? First is geography. Uh, in some of, I think it was Heather's slides, you saw the, the contrast between Asia and Africa. And I think when we start talking clean cooking, we immediately think Africa and we think Africa rural. Um, but those of you that have heard me speak before, I am increasingly concerned about urban uh, the poverty and urban populations who are also still cooking with biomass and in fact are cooking with charcoal. And that charcoal, the process of making charcoal is, a, is, a, is concentrating deforestation around urban areas. So when we go back to that map and we see Asia, we see Asia with 90 something percent electrification. Uh, Africa is 50 percent, uh, around 50 percent electrification. It's very patchy and very uh, distorted across the uneven across the whole continent. But um, we have this opportunity that there is an infrastructure and there is investment. In fact, Kimball just finished on the investment question. You know, the investment question. Uh, for Africa, according to the IEA, $26 billion was invested in electricity each year for the last four years. In developing Asia, $34 billion. In India, $50 billion. Now, I want to come back to the Indian example that uh, Fiona gave about how they are subsidizing LPG. They've spent all this money on electricity, but they've ended up subsidizing LPG. And just this year, they have launched Go Electric, and they want to pivot many of those LPG users into electric cooking. Electric, the Go Electric campaign is about both transport and cooking. Indonesia, again, worried about their subsidies. Yes, they did a fantastic job getting away from kerosene to LPG, um, but uh, worried about that. And so there's an Indonesian task force that is looking to pivot to electricity. Now, I think it was Heather who said, we've been talking about clean cooking. And in one sense, the, you know, once we get into LPG or electric, they're both clean. But uh, I think it was Heather who said, but we haven't looked at where that electricity is coming from. So before somebody catches me on the chat function, I'm going to acknowledge that in Asia, that is still very dirty electricity. But this is where IRENA comes in and UTE and all that integrated planning, because over the next 10, 20 years, it's going to be a massive shift towards renewables. Renewables are cheaper than often the fossil fuel based plants now. And so as the electricity becomes cheaper and cheaper, there's an opportunity there. Energy efficiency, part of SDG 7, we haven't yet talked about energy efficiency. And one of the things that has unlocked electric cooking in just the last five years are energy efficient appliances. They, they really have become <clears throat> such that if you compare a traditional coil hot plate with uh, something like an electric pressure cooker, the electric pressure cooker is cooking at one fifth of the energy of the electric coil consumption. So where it has been affordable uh, previously, it, it uh, is now becoming affordable. Um, and I want to flip back to my urbanization. So urban is a priority. We have places like Kampala, where you have 90% of the one and a half million people in Kampala are, are connected. And, yet, and the electricity is renewably generated, very clean, and yet 70% of households are still using charcoal. It should be a relatively easy transition to flip those people into clean cooking. Now, we all have experienced, or some of us will have experienced Kampala traffic. So when we got, jump all the way back to Julie and Heather's perspective, air pollution is not necessarily going to improve immediately. But actually, the kitchen, the household inside the kitchen could improve dramatically. But then let's just go future think, or not so very future, to the rural Africa area. And it was interesting, I think it was Ute who not, uh, commented that briquette stoves come in at around 100 and actually a biogas unit comes in three to $400. Uh, we, 
we are currently piloting a solar electric cooking system uh, in Malawi that comes in at $300. That's landed cost from China through the customs and actually installed. So I, don't quote me too much on that figure, but that shows the possibilities in the next five to 10 years because things are changing rapidly. Um, it was interesting, hang on, Rob, I'm looking at the time. Right, I'll say one more thing. Uh, and that is that I, I started looking at this possibility of electricity for, for cooking back in 2013. And I was looking at the possibility of battery prices. What would they be in 2020? They have actually come in at half what they were being predicted at, at 2013. And so this momentum that Ute represents in the arena uh, in the renewables, and in fact, we, that which Kimball is talking about, leveraging new uh, biofuels, new bio LPG, new possibilities in creating energy sustainably, we need to leverage those and make sure that they are applicable to uh, the very poor. Uh, I think that's all except just this thing about investment. We need integrated energy planning. I thought Ute was going to say it. She started, got that slide, and at the end of the slide, she's got electricity uh, from renewables. And it was all about you need integrated energy planning. Too much has cooking been on one side and electricity on another side. Let's please bring them together in the coming decade. Thank you. Great, Simon. Thanks a lot. That actually, you know, could uh, segue nicely into the into the panel discussion. So, let me ask the people on the panel to turn on their cameras and turn on their mics so that we can see one another and hear one another. Um, and yeah, I would like to actually kick off with that. Thank you, Simon, for planning that. Um, Uta, uh, how do you see the the prospect? And this uh, extends to Kimball as well, um, you know, how do you see the prospect of, of integrated planning uh, meeting some of these needs, uh, you know, in, in terms of the, the massive scale up that's required? Um, is this, you know, what are the barriers that, that prevent them from happening? Uh, what could your agency, uh, Irena, do uh, either in coordination with others or, or as a standalone effort? And then Kimball, I'm, I'm sure I appreciate your thoughts on that as well. Well, the, the barriers, <laughs> I mean, the, the thing is, you know, something like cooking is always like considered as, um, well, it might, it's not even clear where it sits, right? It's not even necessarily considered as a big energy thing. It's maybe a bit of social policy, what have you. And also, of course, it's women mostly doing it. We know that, that that's an issue and then doesn't get considered. Whereas we know that energy ministers absolutely love cutting a ribbon of a large electric power plant. Mm. It's, it's long been like this. Um, I mean, we, we've got a problem with off-grid electricity as well. That's why I had on my slide, the integrated planning actually needs to bring together the grid, which has had much more investment and lots of subsidies together with the off-grid where the financing is way down and then cooking is sort of the, the total Cinderella. And we, we I mean, it, it's been talked about for quite a few years, but I am sort of reasonably optimistic that that, that message is getting through more. It's also getting support from various donor programs you know, there, there are a number of countries which, which are doing that now. But the important thing as well is that it's not it's not even just energy because you need to bring in agriculture, you need to bring in health. It's that cross-ministerial collaboration which um, ministries, governments always seem to struggle with. But it's it's only when, when we talk to our member states and we do these renewables readiness assessments, that's the kind of thing we tend to stress as well. Kim, do you have anything to add? I mean, in, in terms of yes, not, I, not I, just bio, I, but, but LPG generally and, and the role in- Yes, in the I, I'd like to give some comments about cross-ministerial to supplement what Ute has said, but, uh, and I, I want to uh, sort of caution you that I've been and all the seats at the table 
I've been a development banker, so responsible for public sector money. I've been an advisor to governments. What is the strategy and policy? I've been a, uh, in the private sector, making the investment decisions and operating the infrastructure and having to find markets. And uh, I've been active globally in many geographies, including Africa, well, everywhere. So um, what I uh, have come to believe uh, is, uh, is that you have to understand the political economy of each nation. Let's start with the national level because trade-offs between ministries and the political decisions about how to allocate resources and who has relative power in the development of a set of plans for a country, leaving aside whether the regime is stable enough to carry forward those plans over a reasonable period of time in order to actually achieve them. Understanding what the goal is that you have and then what whether other people can be aligned, can have their interests aligned with yours is very important. So for instance, um, I noticed in the, the slides that we've shown today, we mentioned several ministries, health, environment, so forth. I didn't see the a finance ministry mentioned, but if you're talking about subsidies and if you're talking about having to wind down subsidies, or if you're talking about wanting the private sector to take up more and more of the burden of something, then you have to figure out what's going to get those people aligned and interested and willing to act. So understanding what we want to do with clean cooking and how to align that with the trade-offs and the objectives of other people is very important in, in order to achieve the critical mass of political e economy decision-making that will be necessary. And it's not just uh, the executive branch of a government, it's also the, uh, the, administ the uh, legislative branch. So does will parliament approve it? And will independent technocrats cooperate? Sometimes technocrats can impede the politicians. So, um, and then on top of that, decisions about technology and implementation, the, the, the great curse of developing countries is premature deployment of money for stuff that in fact doesn't work. We've seen that happen before in many places, all of us. So this clean cooking transition, in order to help people over the long term, we have to be really sure that what we ask people to finance and that eventually what it does get financed will be robust and not be subject to early, uh, early di mis mis dysfunctionality or uh, obsolescence, which, uh, which uh, makes th those who financed it um, and the private sector people who are involved, if the private sector is involved, um, um, frustrated or bankrupt. Uh, let me just stop there. But um, that's in regard to this issue of how to align multiple interests. Thanks. Thanks. That's great. Uh, Simon, so can yeah. I build on that, Rob? Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. So I, I think this is, um, I mean, it's really interesting. Webinars hosted by WHO. And I think if we look back over the 10 years, uh, WHO got us started worrying about the health implications of all this dirty cooking or polluting fuel cooking. Um, and as life went on, we became more aware of the gender and the women and children aspect. And as Kimball says, you know, that sometimes sits with the Ministry of Social Affairs, that sometimes sits with other ministries, and very little rises up to the Treasury and the Ministry of Finance. I think as we move forward and looking forward, um, obviously COP26 is around the corner uh, and all your sterling work, I'm going to big you up for all your work on biomass and, and uh, uh, documenting that. But uh, as we move forward, you know, climate is going to be the main agenda. Many of these countries are going to sign up for nationally determined contributions. And I know that CCA are working to include cooking within that. Um, and they're also trying to work towards some sort of coordination unit that might bring different ministries together. So as we move forward into climate, I think climate could be an interministerial uh, uniting factor and that we will get discussion about modern energy planning including, you know, dealing with municipal waste through bio LPG or including off-grid provision of access uh, to, to rural areas. Uh, the climate will be the mantra for the next 10 years, obviously, and I think that that could help us politically. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. I, mean, I think even, even for the past 10 years, you know, or more, climate has been a I don't know, centralizing focus, right? Um, and you have, 
you know, a climate focal point that maybe uh, consists of, of uh, representatives from different ministries, but it's, it's approached differently in, in each country. Um, Not according to Greta, who just said it's all blah, blah up to now. Well, I think that's we're becoming also true. serious. That's also true. Um, so let's not be blah, blah. Um, I have a, a question specifically for Kimball. Um, in, you know, if you look past historically at um, the way biofuels have been integrated into the energy mix in different countries, um, in order to achieve substantial market share, it's always been through a blending mandate or some sort of fuel standard, some sort of fairly aggressive top-down uh, policy approach that's pushed market penetration. Um, and I may be overlooking some, you know, some completely laissez-faire situation where biofuel still reached in, but I don't think so. Um, do you see such a such an approach possible for bio LPG? Um, and if not, how do you how do you envision, you know, really substantially displacing the the fossil alternative, which as you're saying is, is completely identical and already well entrenched? Okay, well, that, thank you for that question. It's obviously something that uh, was an important thing to to consider at the very beginning of the, the quest for uh, bio LPG. Because the quest is not only for something that technically can be implemented. The question is whether it's politically and economically feasible and feasible at scale. There's no point in finding a technical solution that only works for 25 people in a small village up in the mountains. So um, the first question is what is the, uh, what processes uh, can produce LPG physically, so chemically. Then you have to look at them and ask, what are the feedstocks that are used for those processes? Do you have enough feedstock to be able to produce, leave aside the, the cost, do you have enough feedstock to be able to produce large enough quantities to, to make a difference in the fuel supply scenario over a, a long enough period of time? Then, of course, you have to look at economic feasibility. What are the factors that affect the cost of production? So th those are all uh, issues which have to be considered simultaneously in order to justify whether you should chase this, this uh, unicorn or not. So what we started doing uh, years ago was look at the, the routes which are possible, what was being done, what is technically possible, and then what feedstocks are needed to feed that. So the first generation bio LPG that is being produced at quantity is um, uh, biopropane as a roughly 10% volume co-product of producing biodiesel. The feedstock for that biodiesel in Europe and the United States is, uh, uh, is uh, vegetable oils and, uh, and, uh, and used cooking oils and animal fat. So, um, so for every 100 tons of stuff that's produced from one of these biofuels plants, 90 is deep biodiesel and biogasoline and biojet fuel and 10 is propane. So in terms of addressing clean cooking fuel, the propane part, it, it's not very productive. So that's a problem. How much do you get from a ton of feedstock? The second thing is what feedstocks might be available in the developing world, especially at scale, which would give you a substantial solution. So we, we wanted to know whether biogas, especially produced in large central uh, things like um, a, a major city from uh, municipal waste, which is going to be uh, collected and perhaps separated. So will the organic decomposition, which is inevitable, you might as well use that biogas so people want to use it for combined heat and power and so forth. Is it economically a better use of the biogas to turn it into LPG? That was one question. So we had to analyze what's the scale of, bio, of biogas availability using municipal solid waste as a feed and what is the highest and best use of that biogas? And we concluded that A, there was a lot of municipal solid waste, more than enough. And then if you add into that uh, agricultural waste, you can do agricultural residue uh, anaerobic digestion and produce biogas at scale. And we've presented some of those findings in our reports that have been published. Um, you could, that would be another thing. But so the question, those are all feedstocks which are available at scale, reasonably priced. The process, techno-economics to produce LPG work and the output at the plant gate of the bio LPG plant under those assumptions was competitive in the LPG market that exists in those countries and will exist in the future according to our projections and will be more economic than especially the rising price of charcoal, which we see now, which Simon uh, and others have, ref have referred to. So, um, so what I'm saying is that technically it can be done. Economically, it looks feasible subject to of course, more, more work, more assessment, and it's gonna be site specific because municipal solid waste will have different 
patterns and, and characteristics attached to its aggregation and the cost and the logistics cost of aggregating it and separating and so forth. But uh, when the IEA included it in this World Energy Outlook because they were convinced after discussing with us and others that the municipal solid waste alone, especially in urban areas in Africa, could support substantial amounts of bio LPG. Uh, in, in fact, if you look at the projected amount of municipal solid waste in Africa by 2030, which is roughly 300 million tons according to UNEP and IEA, it's, uh, that's enough to produce at current um, conversion ratios, uh, you could produce uh, five to 10 million tons of, of uh, bio LPG, which would be enough to supply the uh, a full cooking need of all, as much as half of the projected population of Africa. So if you're thinking perhaps a electricity LPG stack, maybe that five or 10 million tons of bio LPG could in, in fact, together with electricity, renewable electricity, solve the clean cooking problem. So this is the kind of scale, these are the kinds of questions that we had to uh, pose to ourselves and then try to answer on an interesting enough and evidence-based uh, strong enough to warrant further study in detail. So that's my answer to you, to your complicated question. Okay, thank you. A simple answer. Um, I'm going to bounce over a question to, to Simon now, although I guess this is primarily aimed at Simon, but but uh, it could apply to to any. Um, so there's some a decent amount of evidence that when people first gain access to electricity, um, they don't choose cooking as a as an application, right? They'll they'll choose lighting, they'll choose connectivity or IT applications, they'll choose productive applications, um, and cooking tends to you know, if, if it enters into the mix at all, it, it tends to be less or it tends to be marginal, you know, um, a tea kettle or a microwave, uh, but not a primary cooking device. How do you see that changing? How do you see, where, where do you see the, the behavior change component here? Um, and that also, you know, could apply to, to uh, other new technologies as well. Uh, but since, you know, MEX is primarily uh, promoting uh, electrified cooking, you know, where do you see that component? And of course, a bit of it is economical, um, but not entirely. Um, you know, so where's the behavior change component and, and what do you do to, uh, to induce that? Thanks, Rob. Um, so you say some of it is uh, affordability, um, but not entirely. I agree with that. But until recently, <clears throat> that affordability has been quite a barrier. Um, it's cooking with an inefficient electric stove is more expensive than LPG. It's about the same as LPG. Um, and we know, you know, LPG, people use it and then they revert to charcoal for their long cooks. So that's why we're always talking about the electric pressure cooker because it fits culturally with, with people. And, you know, this is a recent phenomenon. An instant pot who, you know, I've spoken to the vice president, 2010, they were four people in an office. You know, and if they got a hundred, an order for a hundred, they were really excited. They do a hockey stick curve somewhere around 2016, 17. So actually, Africa and Asia haven't really been exposed to energy efficient appliance, cooking appliances for anything more than three or four years. And I think uh, it was Fiona, your Fiona, who said, you know, that many of the policies that are being introduced have been introduced over the last five years. And we don't yet know how they will work out. And, and again, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really want to look back. I want to look forward because we are entering, Irena Ute will talk about the decade of renewables. And there is all sorts of policy, uh, possibilities in terms of policies and moving forward. Behaviour change, just specifically, we, we do... Um, uh, we do start a lot in our research with the cultural acceptability of, of the cooking devices and which are the cultural foods. That, you know, this whole myth about people love smoky flavor. Actually, the urban uh, modern people don't, but they are also then buying their food from street vendors. So how do we work with street vendors? They're sending their kids to school and they get a meal at school. How do we work with really large EPCs to to help the schools pivot. There's, you know, it's all complicated. It's all a complex situation. And, you know, um, Kimball talked about the bio LPG mix with um, electricity. You know, you look at any professional TV chef, 
they're cooking on gas because when you get really fancy, people like to cook on gas. But then you go to Sweden, um, you know, most people are cooking on electricity. UK, it's 50-50 electricity, gas. So there'll be a mix and there'll be a role for the briquettings and the pelletings and the ethanols. We haven't talked much about ethanols and biogas. I mean, we started this with WHO calling for healthy cooking. And I think uh, we need to, to move into that. So I've, I've avoided saying behavioral change too much, Rob, sorry, but I'm aware of time. No worries, no worries. Yeah, so I don't know uh, if we have time for one more, if we should, uh, if I should pass back to the host. We're about three minutes before the hour. Um, and since we had uh, uh, some uh, detailed responses from Kimball and Simon, uh, Uta, do you have any, uh, any uh, final words you want to uh, comment on either related to the, uh, the last questions or, or anything else? Um, well, I mean, I, I think it's not impossible to, especially for as people in urban areas get a little bit better off to have an electric pressure cooker become a bit more of a lifestyle choice as well as people become aware of what they can do. I think Mix is doing some great work there actually and I, I really enjoyed seeing some of this stuff when I was uh, in, in Nairobi at the Clean Cooking Forum. But you know, we got a long way to go and for now we do really need the combination. And, and as we said, you know, different places will have different solutions. So, yeah. Rob, can I say one thing, which is I just want to, to um, I don't, I would like uh, people not to go away with Ute's thought that it's only going to be the upper middle class and the rich and the elite that can buy electric pressure cooker. You know, if with the, with the affordability of the ongoing fuel, uh, and particularly it, it comes down to lifeline tariffs and policies, um, the, then actually slums of Kibera, it's it's cheaper to to find that fifty to sixty dollars through microcredit, through financing, through results-based financing, through carbon credits, and then substitute your charcoal, and that's affordable for the poor as long as there is financing to just make that initial upfront. Yeah, I, I was just thinking because Rob was saying, oh well, you know, when people when they by their solar systems, they're not thinking of pressure cookers because they rather have maybe, I mean, I've seen where they even want to buy a bigger telly. Well, if we can get the pressure cookers in that mix, you know, those people who have a bit more money. I mean, I agree with you. It shouldn't just be for those segments, but... And, and, may, and may I, so may I, so, so I, I just want to add to Simon Uta's point. Mm -hmm. The only people who are really very hard to help are people who are entirely out of the cash economy. What we've discovered in developing countries is that if a household is, takes any part of the cash economy, as long as you can help them over, say, first cost hurdles, especially the poor, uh, the poor deciles in the economy, um, that, uh, that they, they will find the money to, uh, to refuel. We've seen that in, in some of our LPG work. And so the question is, what's the best use of, of public sector money and international institutional money? Is it to create a jump start for people to then enter a, a, an economy which, which can be made available? So I, I just want to caution that rural and poor doesn't mean not able. I just, the question cool. is, which obstacles do you have to remove? Yeah, I think that might be a good place to end on. We're also exactly at the hour. So uh, thanks to all of our panelists and to the conveners of the, the webinar. And I'll pass back to Julie. Great, thanks Rob. And, and thanks again to all of our speakers today and our panelists here. I'm glad we had a bit of a lively uh, discussion, um, which often happens in the sector, uh, which, is, which is great. As we all know, there you know, is no one single way to solve this issue. So it's great that we heard from a number of perspectives today. And um, yeah, some very promising um, solutions on the horizon, which is super exciting. So many thanks again to those who joined us, to our wonderful speakers. Um, as I said at the, the top of the webinar, this is number six in our series for this year. So we hope um, folks have, have been enjoying the series. We have uh, at least one more scheduled uh, for 2021, which will 
take place on October 20th, uh, which coincides with uh, the week of clean cooking. So we hope you have received your save the date for that week and will join us for a range of events um, focused on clean cooking, uh, which include one of these uh, webinars, uh, which will look at climate and clean cooking and the sort of links and considerations there, which will be a nice tee up to uh, COP26, which as we all know is taking place uh, later this year. So with that, we will go ahead and close. Um, again, thank you. And we hope you'll join us for the, the next in our series and also um, hope that you'll join us for that week of clean cooking uh, in October. All right, many thanks. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Bye. bye.